so we're going to dive into the session. Just a little bit about my background. Basically, I've been in clinical research for several decades and started out in academia and worked as a coordinator in academia in the United States, mostly in New York City. And then I transitioned to industry. So my first role in industry was a monitor, a CRA. And then I was a study manager. Then I had quality roles. And uh, I always did some sort of teaching and training. I was a site selection specialist. So I've done a lot of things in the past and been on both sides of the fence, so to speak. About five years ago, I decided to do independent consulting when I do a fair amount of training for Barnett. My focus is training and quality oversight. So that's really a quick, a quick synopsis of my, my background. I can't see you, but that's me. Okay, the objectives are, are listed here in terms of what we'd like to look at today. We want to critically assess the number of major and critical annual BIMO inspection findings. And the BIMO, of course, comes from the FDA. We're focusing really on those major and critical ones because the minor ones, quite frankly, are usually just minor either typographical errors or, you know, very things that don't really impact much in terms of safety and protection of human subjects. So again, we're really focusing on those major and critical findings. We're going to provide the examples from the annual BIMO top inspection findings, and those, are, as I mentioned earlier, will come straight from the FDA warning letters, which are open access to anyone. They are publicly available. And then we're also going to discuss how to prevent these from happening, the major and critical findings. And this is a key if you're working with sites in terms of understanding just from the very beginning when you start to select a site, the kinds of things that we should be looking for and, you know, if things are not, certain things are not in place, it almost opens them up to have some of these, these errors occur. And then also how to apply the correct, correct, right, corrective action, the right corrective action to help resolve the major and critical findings. So we're going to talk about CAP as corrective and preventive action. Okay. So the most common clinical investigator deficiencies are listed here in the order in which they are found. This list and the order has not changed in about seven years. And uh, even though these are the FDA findings, very, very similar to what we find in Europe and what we find in Canada. The first thing, it used to always be informed consent. And then about seven years ago, things flipped. And uh, informed consent is still on there, it's about number six. but what has taken its place is failure to follow the plan, you know, the investigational plan, failure to follow the protocol. So again, the idea that investigators sometimes get creative and do not follow the protocol as specified. Sometimes they you know, enroll patients who do not meet the inclusion criteria and so on, or decide to do something that is not in the protocol or implement something like an amendment before it actually is approved. So these are the kinds of things which is failure to follow the investigational plan or regulations, meaning failure to follow general GCP, like ICH GCP, or a regulatory, whatever the regulatory findings are in terms of, in the U.S. would be FDA, of course, EMA for European studies. Protocol deviations are right up there, right behind it. Inadequate record keeping and inadequate accountability for the investigational product either not having accurate records, not having any records at all, or really not accounting for drug, that, drug or devices that are missing. Inadequate communication with the IRB, either meaning that they have not informed the IRB of various safety reports, have not met their minimum requirements of an annual report to the IRB, and so on have not reported any significant findings like the serious, unanticipated events, those sorts of things. And then, lastly, the inadequate subject protection, which is informed consent issues. So these, as I say, have been the findings, and this, this list has not changed in order in seven years. Okay, so just a little knowledge check for you, if you can just chat in your answer, A, B, C, or D. What is the most frequent FDA inspection finding? based upon what I just showed you. And all you have to do is type in a letter in your chat panel. Right, say it's failure to follow the investigational plan. Okay. 
All right, so why do we have these non-compliance issues with sites? Uh, it comes down to a few things, and the ones I have kind of tweaked out is basically the lack of time, that people are very rushed, they don't have the resources, they, you know, either they don't have enough people to do what they need to do, lack of training, so someone is hired and they're not properly trained before they're put onto a protocol and therefore mistakes happen, or lack of training just in terms of GCP, that could be a part of the issue as well. The staff turnover, we know that we see this frequently, we see it, we see it on our side, we see it on, you know, monitors, there's a frequent turnover of monitors, uh, but we also see it at sites. And again, that turnover, if we have turnover and there's not that training to put in place, we can have those errors pop up that way as well. And then sometimes we see it's the pressure from either the sponsor or from the PI, him or herself, to enroll subjects that can bring to some non-compliance. For example, people start to see the inclusion criteria as a bit fuzzy, that they don't have to follow it to the letter. There's pressure there to enroll their subjects that they're behind and the sponsor is either pushing, 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 or maybe the PI is pushing his or her staff to, you know, find these patients and enroll them. All of a sudden, criteria sometimes gets a little weak, shall we say, that they, they feel that they can bend the rules a little bit perhaps so they get a little more creative with the people they start to enroll and they're not suitable subjects. In other words, they have not really met the inclusion criteria or they have some exclusionary factor and they try to sneak them in or squeak, squeak them by. So again, sometimes it's that. And then if we have really big issues where we do have some, some issues where we have out and out fraud where investigators are making up patients, and this could be, you know, financially driven. Usually there's a financial incentive that drives them. All right, so this is something I'd like to introduce. This is something called Gilbert's Behavioral Engineering Model. And we need all of these things in place to really have optimal performance. And so we can look at this when we see our sites. We can see, do they have these things in place? Are things missing? If anything's missing from here, then we may not get the optimal performance. So I'm just going to go through this briefly with you to kind of show you how this can be used. And certainly you can use this almost as a handout, or not a handout, but something that you can use as a handout for yourself, shall we say, and just kind of check these things off when you're actually looking at a site or doing your site selection. So if we go across the top here, we'll see that these have to do with the environment, the first row across, one, two, and three. Down here, four, five, and six have to do with the actual individual. And let's just break it down a moment. So here we have, in terms of what is needed here in the environment for stimu the stimulus, the information they need. Do they have a description of what's expected of their performance? You know, we can even look at this in our own jobs. If we don't have this in our own jobs, we don't have our maximum performance. So we can look at this this, this way as well as for sites. Are there clear and accessible guides on how to do the job? I'm sure that all of you probably have job descriptions in terms of what you need to do. And so is it clear at the site what everyone needs to do and how they need to do it? And then do they have that timely feedback on their performance? So in other words, if they're going ahead and doing their job, think they're doing it fine and no one tells them otherwise, maybe they're, they're making some error and no one is intervening and telling them that they're making an error, there's not gonna be that feedback to let them know that they're doing, that they're adequately performing. So all of those things need to be in, in place, and that's part of the information package in the environment. Moving over to the resources. Do they have tools and resources and time to really do everything that they need to do? And by tools and resources, that's something that we as, as companies can help them with. We can provide them with checklists, with tools, optional tools, and things that will help make their job easier, perhaps. We usually provide drug accountability logs to sites. Well, that's a tool, right? That is something that can help make their job a little bit easier for them, making sure that they have all of these resources in place, that there's adequate personnel. You know, if, there, if a, a, a coordinator is overloaded, if a coordinator has 12 studies, all of them actively enrolling large numbers of subjects, it's not going to be adequate support to get all of that work done. 
So again, the resource is very important that they have enough personnel. And also access to their readers, access to principal investigators at the sites that would be. Broadly, it's access to leaders. If we're talking about us in our positions, it's access to our bosses, okay? So access to the principal investigator for a site. And then having organized work processes, having those standard operating procedures in place. Now we know that sites are not mandated to have SOPs or SOPs in place. However, it's highly desirable for them to have SOPs in place. So again, do they have them? It's not mandated, but if they do have them, it's just more resource that they have, and it's an organized work process. They know what to do. It's written down. If they need to explain it to someone else, there is some, some written documents that they can actually rely on and use for training purposes and so on. Okay. And then moving to the environment and the incentives. So is there performance-based performance compensation on or incentives? It does not have to always be money either. I always use the example that sometimes we go into, I'm not sure if they do this in Italy, but in the U.S., if you go into a fast food place, something like McDonald's or one of these chain restaurants, you sometimes see employee of the month. It's not a monetary reward, but it's recognition for a job well done. So again, maybe for a site, it's a letter from a sponsor saying that they've done a wonderful job or it's from their boss. So again, some sort of incentive does not have to be financial. So that sort of thing would make the environment suitable and make people want to perform at their maximum best. To have career development opportunities. So those sites that have opportunities for their staff, for a coordinator, shall we say, that they start as a junior coordinator and then maybe move to senior coordinator or what have you. If there's some line of progression, that's another supportive environment for them to maximally perform. And again, if they're not doing the job properly, it's important for that there be clear consequences for poor performance. So again, if all these things are not in place, as I say, there's, there's a good chance that the performance is not going to be up to what we expect it to be, the maximum performance. Now let's look at what the individual needs to have. We just talked about what the environment should be. For the individual, they need the knowledge in terms of what they need to do, that they are matched with their, their, that their talents are matched with the actual jobs that they're being assigned, and that there's opportunity for training. For the capacity in terms of, again, matching personnel and position, having the right person in the right position. Having a good selection process, so meaning that when they interview, that they're interviewing appropriately and doing a robust background check and that sort of thing and having the right person by education and training, which is required by regulation and required by ICH uh, to have the right selection process for having these people in place, making sure it's a good fit, so to speak. And then having flexible scheduling to match the capacity for workers. And then visual aids to help along with that. And finally, in the last section here, in the motive, making sure people have a buy-in. You know, when you go to, to do a site selection, one of the things I always used to do is I talk with the investigator and I talk with the coordinator, usually together, but I'd always make sure I talk with them separately. And sometimes you get very different opinions or different uh, fields. The investigator generally is very excited to do a new study, says, yes, 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 we can do it. Then you talk with the coordinator separately and you find out the coordinator is so overburdened, overworked, that the coordinator cannot even handle the work that he or she has at the moment. And to do another study is just like the last thing in the world that they kind of want to do because they don't have the capacity. So again, understanding what the capacity is and the willingness to work and how they, if they're really accepting the program. So again, you're not going to have a large-scale acceptance of the program if someone is so overworked that they just can't do another bit. So again, having all of these things in place, and they tie in together with a lot of the others in terms of making sure that people are resourced properly. And again, making sure that we have the, the personnel to match the realities of the work conditions. So this is, a, I think, a handy kind of chart to look at in terms of looking at the behavioral, human behavioral makeup and see, are all these things in place to make sure that we have the right people and we will have the right performance from our site?
Okay, we talked about standard operating procedures, and as I mentioned, they are not re they're required for us, from us as sponsors, but they're not required for sites, although they're highly desirable. So again, if, they, if a site has these SOPs, very helpful in terms of ensuring that everybody knows what they're doing, there'll be consistent ways people will work, and it will identify who does what task. So it's not that one person is thinking the other person will do something, and if person A thinks person B will do something, and person B thinks that the A is doing it, no one ends up doing it. So again, having the right person identified for each task, and then having the, the standard operating procedure be a tool, a training tool for any new people, new personnel that come on board. So an SOP is important, and we'll see later on how SOPs play a very important role in our corrective and preventive actions. Frequently, a new SOP or an SOP revised is a good solution to correct and prevent problems. Again, one thing that we like to mention to people is that it's, it's wonderful to have standard operating procedures in place and we tell them the whole reasons, but then we want to make sure that if they have SOPs in place that they follow them because it's really bad uh, if you have an SOP and you don't follow them. The SOP will be something that a regulator will hold the site up for uh, scrutiny. So when you go to a site, it's good for you to ask, do they have SOPs for you to see the SOPs? Because if they're not adhering to their own SOPs, that will be a regulatory finding. Just as if they didn't follow regulation or if they didn't follow ICH it will be a finding if they don't follow their own standard operating procedure. So good for you to ask if they have them, see them, and make sure that they are following what they say in their standard operating procedure. Okay, so a little bit about root cause analysis and corrective and preventive action. With the new ICH revision two of the ICH E6, you know, there's a revision two, which Europe has now adopted, I believe, the U.S. has not fully adopted it yet, but with Revision 2, it is now actually telling us that as sponsors, we need to go in to sites and do a root cause analysis and come up with a corrective and preventive action for issues that arise. So even though as best practice we did this in the past, it is now actually written in the guidance, in that new guidance. So the root cause analysis obviously is there to identify the true cause of a problem of a discrepancy or a deviation, and then should suggest corrective actions of a problem which is identified. Now, root cause analysis can present um, one root cause or multiple root causes. There sometimes is more than one. Once we find the root cause, then we can address it appropriately. And then we can put something in place that will correct the immediate problem, but yet we want to put it in place to prevent it from happening again. Let's use the example of an informed consent. Perhaps the incorrect version of an informed consent was used by a site. Uh, they may have had an amendment and they made a revision to the consent form. And when the patient came in, they did not get the correct informed consent. So we can say, well, to correct this problem, what do we do? Well, to correct the problem, we just have, we'll have this, the patient sign the correct form when they come in the next time and we will explain that inadvertently we gave them the wrong one to sign and we'll make our note and that corrects it. Well, yes, but what does it do to prevent it from happening again? Now, this may just be a one-time occurrence, but frequently we find that a lot of these incidences are not one-time. So we want to delve a little more deeply. Why were they given the wrong informed consent? And if we ask, there are various ways to do this. The five whys is one way. Are, are both of you familiar with the root cause analysis and how to do that? You can just chat in yes or no in your panel. We have five whys. We have something called the fishbone diagram. Okay, Sylvia, you are. Okay. And Kiara, how about you? Yes, good, perfect. Okay, so don't have to spend a lot of time on that. But the uh, corrective and preventive action, we want to make sure that we delve down deeply. And so how did, how did it happen that they, they got the wrong form? Well, 
perhaps we could say they, they grabbed the wrong one out of the drawer. Well, why did that happen? And we might find out that that day maybe a different coordinator was on, the regular coordinator was out, someone was substituting. So we might find that the, the real root cause there is that the person was not trained to do it properly. We might also find that we say, well, why was the wrong one there to even begin with? We, why were old versions there? If they had a new version, they should only have their version that was approved by the IRB, but any other subsequent blank copy should have been destroyed. We shouldn't have the old copy so it would, you know, lend us to just make a mistake. So again, we go delve through this a little bit more deeply. We can find different solutions to this. We can get rid of all those old ones and only have the most recent version available for blank copies to use for the, the new subjects or the subjects that need to sign consent. We can also do other things. We can think of maybe color coding our informed consent so that the first one is white page, the second one is maybe green paper, so it's another visual cue. So we can think of a lot of different things to put into place that might prevent that from happening again. So just a, a quick example. Okay, so another knowledge check, true or false, you can give me a green check mark or a red X. Standard operating procedures are mandated by regulation, and this relates to sites, by the way. Correct, they are not mandated by, uh, for sites. Okay, so let's look at the FDA first. So what could possibly go wrong? The most frequent findings related to the investigational product. I'm, I'm going to break this down into a few different buckets. So with the investigational product, this is right out of the FDA in terms of what they find as the, the, the top finding. Failure to remove the drug label from the package dispensed to the subject and affixed to the drug accountability records. So if that is required per protocol, that is one of the big findings they have, that that's not done properly. And all of this comes under the failure to maintain adequate records of the disposition of the drug, including dates, quantity, and use by subjects. The next thing would be failure to maintain an accurate record of drug received at your site. So that would be the inventory with the first shipment that comes in. And also the drug that goes out to subjects and comes back in. So basically having those drug accountability records accurately filled out. Then failure to adequately document transfer of study drug from one approved facility to another. We know we like to avoid this at all costs, but we don't like to really transfer drugs, but sometimes we have to do so um, because of a shortage, expiration dates, or maybe the drug is too expensive. You know, our study maybe has gone on longer than we anticipated, and the drug expiration date now is it's moving up, so we have to kind of shift things around. So again, the documentation, which has to be very robust, sometimes it's not up to the standard it should be. And then failure to record dates and the quantity of all investigational product dispensed. So these are sort of the most frequent findings in terms of investigational products. So let's take a, a, some examples here and what actually did go wrong. And this comes right out of the FDA warning letters. So this one had to do with devices. The investigator, and it was an investigator-initiated device study, which is sometimes I find the investigator-initiated trials have a few more problems than the sponsored trial. Okay, so the specific findings from this particular letter were that there were no device accountability records to show which investigational device was used in which subject. Okay. So the question is, how would you respond? Now, I do have the excerpt here. In terms of the warning letter, the, the investigator responded to the warning letter, and this is what uh, the FDA had responded back after the investigator tried to answer the findings of the FDA. The FDA said, your written response states that prior to this work, on these particular device studies. All of the research performed by your office had been done with corporate sponsors who prepared IDE applications and helped you stay on track record-wise. Remember, this one now is an investigator-initiated trial. So he is stating that all his other studies were sponsor-related and, and, and sponsor trials, and they provided all of this for him. The FDA goes on to say, your response acknowledges that you failed 
to obtain FDA approval before, before in both studies and that you fail to obtain IRB approval before initiating these, these two studies. There were two different device studies, actually. And you contend that you did obtain IRB approval before initiating the study, but that you cannot, to date, locate the documentary proof of such approval. And we know in clinical research what we say is if it is not documented, meaning written down somewhere, it didn't happen. So, if, you know, him stating that he had the approval but no proof to show it just means that we're assuming that he doesn't have it. Your response also acknowledges that for both studies you were negligent in your record keeping, monitoring, and device accountability. So don't forget, if it's an investigator-initiated trial, they are still mandated to monitor the trial. Okay? When it's an investigator-initiated trial, the investigator serves as the sponsor as well. So this was a bit of a mess, this, this particular morning letter, I'd have to say. Your response also states that you will know what is required of you and you will do it, including adopting the responsibilities of the sponsor, if applicable, and you will know the responsibility of the IRB. Well, he should have known this before he embarked on this study, yes? Okay, so, do you think that the FDA found that this response was adequate? And you can just give me a yes, no, or not sure in the, the green check mark red X. Yeah, red X basically is not, not acceptable for sure. So let's think about what else might be added. So I want you to kind of think yourself and put in your chat panel here what you think, if you were helping out this investigator to respond to this, what other, what other things might the, in, the investigator include in this warning letter? So go ahead and just go ahead and chat that in. Okay, so we have investigator insight staff to train on GCP or applicable regulation, yes. Oh, they're sponsored investigator, yeah. Okay, so training definitely, um, we want to see some of that put into place for sure. So let's see. So here's where the warning comes in now from the FDA. This, this is still part of that warning letter. So the warning here is your response is inadequate, as we suspected, right? In that contacting the FDA may be a first step. However, you need a corrective action plan that includes training, which you suggested, Sylvia, excellent, as you are responsible for knowing and following the regulations pertinent to your activities as a sponsor investigator in FDA-regulated studies. Please provide copies of policies, procedures, and training with expected completion dates that are being developed and implemented to prevent the recurrence of these violations in future clinical studies. So by saying that they're going to retrain or train the, the staff and, you know, that he'll undergo training is good, but it doesn't go far enough. What regulatory bodies want to see, and this is not just the FDA, they want to see the whole package. So in other words, if you are creating a new standard operating procedure, they want to see the standard operating procedure, they want to see the date that it's going to be implemented, the date you're going to train on it, how you're going to train new people, and actually actually see what the SOP is, send it into them. So here what they're asking for is they want copies, copies of the policies and procedures and, and training with expected completion dates. They want that whole package. So if you just say we're going to train, or even if we're going to train everyone by a certain date, they want to see what you're training on, so actually sending them the policies and sending them all of this information. So if it's not complete like that, regulators will turn it back and say it's not acceptable. So that's what we need to keep in mind. And then we see these two paragraphs at the end of each and every warning letter. It doesn't change. I'm only going to show it to you this once. But it, it goes on to state that this letter is not intended to be all-inclusive list of deficiencies with your clinical study of an investigational drug. So that kind of covers them in terms of if they've missed something. It is your responsibility to ensure adherence to each requirement of the law and relevant FDA regulations. 
you should address these deficiencies and establish procedures to ensure that any ongoing or future studies will be in compliance with FDA regulation. Then within, this is important, within 15 working days of your receipt of this letter, you should notify this office in writing of the actions you have taken to prevent similar violations in the future. Failure to address the violations noted above adequately and promptly may result in a regulatory action without further notice. So again, people get into more trouble if they don't answer this. Now, I always get the frequent question is, what happens if within the 15 working days they do not have everything in place? That is okay. We just need to have some sort of response sent back to the regulators, right? So we need to actually tell them what our plan is. Maybe we haven't really developed our new standard operating procedure yet, but we will tell them what our intention is. So as long as we respond with something within the 15 working days and let them know that, you know, something else is coming that either maybe they haven't completed, they, maybe they created their new standard operating procedure, but haven't really fully implemented it yet. And so we have a timeline and they will follow up. So in other words, we send that letter in within 15 working days to the FDA and then follow it up with the subsequent actions if everything is not completed within those 15 working days. But not a good idea not to respond within that time frame. All right, here's another knowledge check for you. Just a true or false with the green check marker red X. After receiving an FDA warning letter, you should notify the FDA in writing of the actions you have taken to prevent similar violations in the future. This should be done within 15 calendar days of your receipt of the letter. Ah, it's a trick question actually. It's actually false because it says 15 calendar days and it's actually 15 working days. The 15 working days actually gives you a little more time because the 15 working days would not include the weekends. If we said 15 calendar days, then it's less. So it's in the regulation, it is 15 working days. It was a trick question. Well, tricky question, I should say. Okay, now the second case I have here deals with control with drug, basically, again. You fail to take adequate precautions to prevent theft or diversion of an investigational drug that is subject to the Controlled Substances Act. As a clinical investigator, when handling an investigational drug that is subject to Controlled Substances Act, you are required to take adequate precautions to prevent theft or diversion of the substance into the illegal channels of distribution. This is a case actually that happened in Miami, Florida, here in the United States. And this investigator had a substantial number of drugs, so substance, Schedule II drugs stolen. So the FDA goes on to say, these precautions include the storage of the investigational drug in a securely locked, substantially constructed cabinet, or other securely locked, I'm sorry, yeah, or other securely locked, potentially constructed enclosure, access to which is limited. The investigational drug for this particular protocol is classified by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration as a Schedule II controlled substance based on structural relatedness to neuroxamorphone. So again, this is a Schedule II drug, a controlled substance, so it's, you know, it's even subject to even more restrictive regulation. So how do you respond if this happens now? Uh, you've had this drug is stolen from your site and you were supposed to have it in a secure location. So it goes on to say, in your June, now this is what the investigator responded and now the FDA is responding back to the investigator. In your June 3rd, 2013 response to the violation noted in uh, above, you acknowledge that the theft of this drug at your site was due to the lack of stringent security monitoring and measures. You indicated that to prevent similar violations in the future, you implemented the following. Two new standard operating procedures, and she has a pharmacy operation, and she has the version and the date listed here, and the pharmacy diversion policy with the version and date. Also, there's a use of a new surveillance cameras and an alarm system in hallways leading to and inside the pharmacy. 
moving the pharmacy to a more secure location, and then use, use of a locked cabinet system for storing investigational drugs classified as controlled substances. Limiting access to these investigational drugs classified as controlled substances to designated employees only, and changing pharmacy door locks and reassigning new keys to designated employees only. So she said quite a bit there. In addition, she also has a new master drug accountability log. In addition, there now is a master drug accountability log that you created that the coordinator is responsible for. A specific trial will update every require the coordinators to have the medication number and protocol assigned number cross-checked by another coordinator prior to it being given to the subject. So she has a double check method here. So she's put a lot of stuff in place here. So what do you think? Do you think the response is adequate? Again, give me a green check mark for yes, red X for no, or a smiley face for not sure. Yeah, it does sound like she's done quite a bit. I agree that this sounds very good. So let's see what the FDA had to say. Well, they found her response inadequate. Surprising because she had put so much in place. You'll be surprised to hear what, what has been uh, objectionable. Okay, so your response is inadequate because you failed to provide a copy of the new standard operating procedure about the pharmacy operations and pharmacy diversion prevention policy. As a result, we are unable to determine whether your corrective actions appear sufficient to prevent a recurrence of similar violations. So she did all the right things. She just forgot to really include the actual policy. She put the version date, told them what it was, but didn't show them what it was. So because she didn't attach those two documents, they found her response inadequate. But the rest, is they, they did go on. I don't have the whole letter here. It's actually, if you want to look up this letter, it's Dr. Anna, A-N-A, Sandino. F like Frank, A-N-D-I-N-O. And you can see the whole, the whole history, the whole letter on FDA.gov. But it's, uh, she, they did find everything else acceptable. And I think with the submission of those two documents, they would have just, you know, uh, been fine with her uh, plans, basically. So we have some tips here in terms of creating um, a clinical, clinical trial procedures manual create a general accountability log that may be used for multiple studies, hire trained clinical staff with experience in clinical trials, and engage the entire office in running a successful research site and considering mock visits. In other words, before a patient is actually enrolled, the site should do sort of a trial run, so to speak, where they have maybe the receptionist pretend to be the patient and everybody goes through the steps to make sure that they know what they need to do and the time involved and so on. Another thing would be to designate a special area to store investigational products separate from regular drug supply. I personally know that from my own monitoring experience that they have been issues when there isn't a very clear definition of where that drug is being stored away from regular drug supply. I had the incident once when I went to close out a trial and um, go to a research pharmacy. Now, the pharmacy basically was set up to do research. They, I mean, there were the regular pharmacy, but they had research pharmacists there. This was an in-hospital study, so of course you have 24-hour staffing to worry about. When I went to do the final mm. closeout and retrieve all of the drug that was left, we found that we were short. Now, this was a phase four study, so I will say that it was an approved medication. It was an IV antibiotic. It was an approved medication. However, it was marked for investigational use. And some of that investigational use product got sent and used in the general population. So there was no way to track that particular drug. It was a mistake that should not have happened. The pharmacist made the error. And again, what happened here was that the pharmacist clearly was not trained, even though it was labeled investigational use, saw the product name, saw that it was an approved drug, and just went ahead and, and dispensed it as needed to whomever actually requested the drug. And so when it was general supply, even though it was in a separate cabinet. So again, where, this come in, where does this come in? Lack of training. There wasn't that 
follow through of the regular research pharmacist who was on duty during the days. This was the night person. Uh, there wasn't that clear instruction. So that was a little bit of a problem. So again, it's just having all of these things in place, as I mentioned earlier with that behavioral model, the adequate training, the right personnel, having everything in place and people really knowing what they need to do. Okay, and then providing ongoing education to the research team, and then providing an SOP for double checking, dispensing, and accountability records. Always a good idea to have another set of eyes on these. And then consider who will be involved in the subject's care, especially if this is an inpatient setting, which brings into play the example I just used. When we have an in, in patient study, it is always more complicated because we have usually three shifts, if not three, then two shifts of people, you know, nurses, physicians, pharmacists to worry about. So it's not just the one eight-hour shift we're worried about during the day. We are now worried about, well, who's on, you know, for the 24 hours and the change of shifts, do they all have the same adequate information about our subjects? Then checking for drug destruction policies, will you be destroying on the site? And then approval is needed from the sponsor, if that's the case. And then final accountability needs to be done before any of that drug destruction happens. And then provisions for single blind studies, how there's a lot of errors that happen in terms of the single blind, in terms of how do we manage the records and preserve the blind. When we have, so for example, a blinded and an unblinded monitor and a blinded and unblinded either investigator or coordinator, how do we keep those things straight? One of my worst studies to manage was, was one as a study manager uh, that had multiple CROs involved and had uh, blinded and unblinded components to it. And the unblinded monitors had a great deal of responsibility, not just to go in and check the drug. They had actually a complete case report form to complete. So again, it was keeping those things very separate at the site, and it was, it, was, it was complicated. This article, Accountability from this FDA records, this is what the FDA does recommend. The record should be sufficient to show that the subjects received proper dose or, de or the proper device, which dose, vial, or device was provided to which subject and when, accountability for all investigational products, and the product was shipped, received, and stored at the proper, room, uh, proper temperature and condition. Okay, another knowledge check for you by using these symbols. Which is the best, what is the best way to ensure that the investigating site is prepared for an inspection? You can give me either the raised hand, green check, mark red X, or the little forward mark. And if you don't have the forward mark, uh, you could use the smiley face. Right, you're absolutely correct by complying with ICH guidelines. Okay, the most frequent findings now related to informed consent. We'll go into, we talked a lot about drugs, which is a big issue, and now the informed consent issues. So again, the most frequent findings according to the FDA is failure to obtain informed consent in accordance with the regulation, failure to use the informed consent document that had been approved by the IRB, which I gave you an example of a little bit earlier, and failure to ensure study subject signed and informed the informed consent prior to the involvement in the study. We see that this happens frequently where the site may start doing certain, what we consider protocol specific procedures and they don't consider them procedures. For example, say we need to have a patient go on to a study but they need to be washed out from their previous medication. If they start that washout, if the site starts the washout, uh, in anticipation of the protocol, they need to get an informed consent before they start that washout. And a lot of sites do not understand that. They will, in anticipation of, hey, this patient is, seems like a good candidate, we'll take them off their particular drug. Well, once they start doing that, they really need to have the informed consent signed. And this may be something that, you know, you might have to educate your sites about. There are other instances where, can, maybe can you think of some instances where sites start their subjects in some format, some, some procedure, and before they get the informed consent. Go ahead and chat that in if you do have something, or you can unmute yourself and let me know if you have an example. 
Yeah, this is Celia. Yeah. Uh, I just have a comment because uh, it's quite common these days to have um, the site asking to write at the time the patient signs the consent, uh, just to check that the rest, if if you know if screening is done within, it's started within the same day of signing the consent, just to check that everything else is done thereafter. Do you think that's really mandatory? Because it's it's. Uh, I have several opinions. Uh, I've heard several opinions. Right. So if they have the time of the consent, now the time of the consent is not necessarily be on that form. However, it's a good idea to have it documented somewhere because you want to make sure that the informed consent was indeed signed before they did any of the specific screening procedures. So a good example. The, uh, per, like blood work, say they did some lab work. Um, if they drew the blood, we want to make sure that that has happened after they signed informed consent, not before. And we can sometimes see that as monitors. We go and we look and see the time of the blood draw on the requisition slip or on the actual lab report. It doesn't coincide with maybe their visit schedule. Uh, sometimes you have to look even at the appointment schedule the appointment book at the site to see when the site, when the subject was scheduled, when they were actually seen, when their chart note was written, and when their informed consent was signed, and then the sequence of events in terms of the informed, uh, the, um, I'm sorry, when they drew the labs or whatever else they needed to do if they sent them for any um, a preliminary examination. So again, having the time is valuable. And it's you know desirable to have it at least in the source document. And sometimes we'll see a statement written there that all study procedures were done after informed consent was signed. We do want to sometimes do a little deeper dive on that, a little more exploration to make sure that if they came in at nine o'clock in the morning into the at the site and they were having their blood drawn at nine oh five. We know there hasn't been enough time for them to read and sign a consent form, unless, of course, they came in, you know, a week or two weeks before and reviewed the consent form and that sort of thing. So it's, sometimes we need to be a little bit of a detective to uh, look at the records and see and question. You know, the subject came in at 9 o'clock and we see 9.05, the blood was drawn. There wasn't time to really get adequate informed consent before that unless it happened, you know, at a previous visit. So I don't know if that helps answer your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so perfect. So let's let's move forward here. Thanks for the question and the scenario. Common informed consent problems that we see from the FDA list here is that their study-specific procedures are performed before informed consent is obtained, as we just discussed, or the informed consent discussion is conducted by someone who's not authorized or properly trained. So sometimes we find that the investigator is having other people elicit the consent, which would be okay if it's a sub-investigator and someone who has the adequate knowledge and training, and it's also on that delegation list. And then sometimes we see people that are delegated this task and they're not the appropriate people. So this is another fi big finding in terms of the FDA, having it, uh, the incorrect people actually administer the informed consent. And then what is the IRB's intent for the investigator's signature on the form if another person discusses the study? Uh, what if the investigator signs it later? Now, we know by regulation and also by ICH, the investigator is not mandated to sign the informed consent unless he or she is the person eliciting the consent. So if there's another sub-investigator eliciting the consent, PI signature is really not necessary. But we do have some sponsors or some IRBs who insist on having the investigator sign, the PI sign. So then we have to figure out what do they, why do they want that signature? What's the purpose? Is it the purpose that they want to make sure that the PI is the one that is eliciting the consent? And in that case, only that person should be uh, signing as the person eliciting the consent? Or is it simply to show oversight? And in that case, perhaps the investigator was not at the site the day that patient was seen, and a sub-investigator who was appropriately delegated and qualified elicited the consent, but there is a line now for the PI to sign. 
So the PI signs then, in the, in, we have to clarify that, but maybe the IRB means that just to show oversight, that there was some discussion about that patient and that there was, that the PI is approving, basically, approving the, the action of having this subject included in their trial. So again, we have to be very clear on what, if there's an investigator line for them to sign on, what does that actually mean? And then what is the sponsor's or IRB's expectation for reconsent when the consent form is revised? You know, sometimes we have a revision and it may not, you know, say it's something in the, the very first visit that we need to do or in the screening visit. Well, if it's only in the screening visit, we don't necessarily have to reconsent all the patients that are in the study already and have passed that point in time. Is it a safety issue? Then we have to go back and inform everyone. So the whole question here is what, what's the sponsor's IRB's expectation for reconsent? And again, sometimes we find, or the FDA is finding, that the reconsent was not done appropriately. Either not everyone was reconsented that should have been, that sort of thing. So again, just it depends on the nature of what the revision to the consent was. And then of course, the very obvious, the signature, initial, and date irregularities. And I have to say, for those folks who require, and usually it's an IRB uh, requirement, so those people who actually require uh, initial and date on every single page of the informed consent, I think that is so silly. I, it doesn't really do anything. By signing, you know, having an initial and date on each and every page of the informed consent does not ensure that the subject has read every page. It just ensures that they've scribbled their initials on every page. And when we ask them to do that, so frequently we have errors where there's a page that was missed, or maybe they put their two initials on one and three initials on another. So it just lends itself to a lot of discrepancies and doesn't really serve the purpose of making sure that they've signed every page. So again, um, when we have that, it just kind of lends itself. And I don't know if you have any studies that require that initial and date every page, but it does present some issues. So again, just having the signature, or initial and date, any irregularities if there's mistakes made as well. And then form not in the language understandable to the subject. We know that we need to have the informed consent written in the language that the person understands. And the only time that we actually can do with this verbal consent or oral consent is if we have a person who cannot read at all in any language, they're illiterate. And then we go to our, you know, witness comes into play. But otherwise, we do need to have it in the language that the, the subject understands. So that's been another finding. All right, here's another case now. Here's a case dealing with informed consent right from the FDA warning letters. Here it is, you fail to obtain informed consent in accordance with the provisions of the Code of Federal Regulations. No investigator may involve a human being as a subject in research unless the investigator has obtained the legally effective informed consent of the subject or the subject's legally authorized representative. Now we know the legally authorized representative is in special cases where we have a subject who is either a minor or someone who is cognitively impaired or in those uh, special categories. Okay, informed consent shall be documented by the use of a written consent form approved by the IRB and signed and dated by the subject or the subject's legally authorized representative at the time of consent, and a copy shall be given to the person signing the form. So the specific findings on this one were that you fail to obtain legally effective informed consent for a subject who was prescribed the investigational new drug. Specifically, the informed consent form for this subject was signed by someone other than the subject. During the inspection, it was observed that both the handwriting and the signature of the subject were inconsistent between the subject's consent documents and the subject's study diary. So what this inspector did, and sometimes as monitors, you know, we don't, we don't look at the records the way an auditor or an inspector would. And I think we need to start doing a little bit more of that. So what they did was they didn't just look at the informed consent and say, oh, it's signed, it's fine. What they did was they looked and they saw that, okay, there, there are medical records here that are written, and there's a, a subject's diary. So the subject wrote on this diary, and then there were some other signatures in there. You know, sometimes it's an intake sheet 
uh, something in their medical record where they could see their signature. And they saw that the signatures there were not the same as what was on the informed consent. So how do you respond to this? So here's, the, here's what happened in that interchange, exchange. rather. In your response, you acknowledge that someone other than the subject did sign the, infor the informed consent documents because the subject's hands were shaking. Hmm. So what do you think about that? Was that response adequate? Absolutely not, no. And then what else might be added? So just think about that in terms of, do you think, can you think of something else? Of course, we need a little bit more information here too, I would say. But you can chat in your thoughts. Right, what is the real reason? I mean, it sounds like it was a person that didn't need someone uh, like a legally authorized representative. So, you know, what's the whole story there? All right, so here's what the FDA said. Let's, let me go back here a minute. The FDA said, you failed to confirm or document that this person was the subject's legally authorized representative, so that's number one, and I suspect this person did not need an LAR, a legally authorized representative. The regulations require that informed consent be signed and dated by the subject or the subject's legal representative prior to the subject's involvement in the investigation. Failure to obtain adequate informed consent jeopardizes the safety and welfare of enrolled subjects by denying them an opportunity to assess the risks and benefits of their participation in the investigation. So they acknowledge, the FDA acknowledged their response. However, we are concerned that your response is inadequate since you did not propose corrective actions to prevent future recurrence of the violation noted above. And I can tell you that when we, ha we didn't have, I mean, you can look at these uh, whole letters, but when the hands were shaking, well, what does that mean? You know, we don't even know. Is this something that is, is this somebody who has some disease? It was it just that day that their hands were shaking? They were obviously able to fill out their own patient diary and fill out other paperwork. Why weren't they able to fill out the consent form? Uh, we have another example, actually, where in another study that patients didn't sign the informed consent themselves because their eyes were dilated as an ophthalmology study. So the question arises, well, why, is their eyes, why would their eyes be dilated even before they're, you know, got, we got the consent? So there's so many different things that pop into to play here, and the sequence of events is all incorrect. Here we want to know more about why the hand's shaking. Is there a disease? Is this something that they would need a legally authorized representative? And it doesn't appear that they do. So again, if that was another inadequate response. Here we have another case, number four. You fail to obtain informed consent in accordance with the uh, code of federal regulations because the informed consent documents that you used for these two protocols did not contain all of the required elements of informed consent. This one is pretty interesting. The specific findings here are that the informed consent forms did not contain a statement regarding any additional cost to the subject that may result from the participating in the research as required by the code. And research subjects were presented with a billing agreement only after they had already consented to participate in the clinical research. I can tell you that this investigator, um, I'm surprised he's not debar debarred uh, from doing research. There have been multiple issues with this investigator. I only highlighted this one particular problem. But basically, he withheld information about a financial component that they'd be responsible for until after he got them to, to participate and sign on to the consent. So in his written response, here's what he said. Um, the FDA responded to him too. It says, in your written response to this observation, you acknowledge that the treatment billing agreement is only presented to the patient after the informed consent document is signed. In addition, you stated that at times, days or weeks may elapse between the signing of the informed consent and presenting the treatment billing agreement. As a corrective action, listen to this one. As a corrective action, you propose amended wording to informed consent documents to address the lack of a statement regarding additional costs to the subject that may result from participating in the research. So, what do you think? Is that re response adequate or not? What he's 
No, it's not. Absolutely, it's not. So what else might we want to see him, this investigator do? Because this is sort of like what we would call bait and switch, you know, where you kind of entice someone to do something, and then all of a sudden the, the rules of the game change. Any suggestions what else he needs to do besides just what he said he's going to do here? He says he's, all he's going to do is amend his wording in the informed consent to uh, address that there's a lack of statement regarding additional costs may result. He's not telling them that there is additional costs. He's just going to say, well, there may be some additional costs when there is going to be additional costs, for sure. So let's proceed forward here. Oops, went too far. All right, so your proposed, this is what they came back with from the FDA. Your proposed amended wording is not adequate because it focuses primarily on whether there is a charge for the investigational agent. It contains only general statements regarding the possibility of additional costs and puts the responsibility on the subject to inquire about any expected added costs rather than providing the subject with specific additional costs that may result from participation in the research. In contrast, the treatment billing agreement identifies the specific additional costs the subject will be expected to pay as a result of participating in the research. So they, there is a billing agreement, they just are not presented with that at the time of consent. The informed consent document itself must include the information about the additional cost to the subject that may result from participation in the research and failure to provide subjects with information regarding any additional costs prior to obtaining informed consent denies subjects the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding their participation in the trial. And as I say, this, this guy really, this investigator really did a lot of very unethical things in some other scenarios. And I just pulled this one, one case out. Some tips for sites, basically. A version dating the consent, having a footer on each, each page of the consent to make sure that they have the right consent and it's all together. Color coding consent forms. Written process for submission, revision, and annual review of consent forms. You know, sometimes people are using an informed consent that has not yet been approved by the IRB, and that's a problem, unless it's a safety concern. We have exemptions for that. A checklist or worksheet is something that can be provided. Organized, consistent filing system, allowing adequate time for a consent process, and ensure only qualified staff are involved in the informed consent process. So some tips regarding the workarounds for some informed consent. I did attach a number of uh, documents which we'll go through in terms of uh, things you might share with sites if you wish. We'll go through those at the end. Okay, checking the consent form, does the form contain all of the elements? Are the pages all present? And if they are required to be initialed, are they initialed? Is the form IRB approved? Who signed the form? Is the PI required to sign or was the consenter properly delegated, qualified and trained to perform the informed consent? And across forms, are there initial signature irregularities? Have all ongoing study subjects been reconsented as newer versions of the informed consent have been approved? And was the subject given a signed and dated copy of the informed consent? Were there any consents that required a witness, for example, in illiterate subjects or sent up for children? Did the investigator continue to provide information as the subject or situation provide, required? For example, updated revised informed consent forms with evidence of the IRB approval, emergent safety information, which we'd find in, in safety letters uh, as well, information that may influence the subject's continued consent. And then we have another case here, pediatric clinical trial where the, the investigator failed to ensure that the investigation was conducted according to the signed investigator statement, which would be the 1572, if this were an FDA trial, which it was, in that you failed to personally conduct or supervise the clinical investigation. The specific findings here were, the investigation indicates that your supervision of personnel to whom you delegated study tests was not adequate to ensure that the clinical trial was conducted according to the signed statement and the investigational plan and so on, we noted that your failure to adequately supervise the study led to significant problems with the conduct of the study, including submission of full information 
to the sponsor in a required report, which is a whole separate infraction. He repeatedly or deliberately submitted false information to the sponsor in a required report. According to the protocol, symptoms will be assessed with the help of a parent or garden, guardian of the subject for seven days before randomization. And on the morning of visit three, symptoms will be evaluated at visit three to meet the inclusion criteria before randomization into the study. Our inspection revealed the following. For subjects two and five, diary scores were falsified. So this is a really bad one, okay? And specifically, our inspection revealed that scores were changed after the subject's diaries had been submitted to you and without permission from or knowledge of the subject's parents. So this is actually changing the data. Case report forms and diaries reviewed during the inspection also indicated that for subjects 2, 5, 7, and 17, changes were made to the Visit 3 diary instantaneous scores. Here's where it gets a really craziness now. Changes were made to those scores. These changes appear to reflect false information in that they were made after the subject's diaries had been submitted by the subject's parents containing scores that did not meet eligibility criteria. So you see what happened here. They had the diaries, they filled them out, brought them back into the site. The kids did not meet criteria and then the site went ahead and changed the scores to make it seem like the, the children could get into the study. But wait till you see what, they, what happened here. The changes resulted in subjects two, five, seven, and 17 meeting inclusion criteria for randomization. All right, so these are the falsification, the falsification of the documents that got them in. We note that these four subjects were the only subjects randomized in the clinical investigation. So what does that mean? All of their subjects are now have falsified data. We further note that you subsequently submitted the above false information to the sponsor in a required report. There's another infraction. So how do you respond to this one? You stated in your response to the Form 483, which is the findings, the initial findings, that many of the detailed findings were mistakes made by your study coordinator. These were intentionally, by the way, intentionally changed scores. Okay, so what does the PI do? Blame the coordinator and say that they were mistakes made by the study coordinator. And that if you had supervised her work more closely, perhaps that would have prevented the repetition of several errors. So we should see this as more than just errors. This is intentional uh, falsification. We acknowledge your response. You stated that your study coordinator was responsible for changing these diary data. Additionally, we note your statement that you placed the study coordinator on a 30-day probationary period following the sponsor's audit of this study, during which time all study procedures and documentation were closely observed and reviewed by the department manager and you. You also stated that at the end of this time, the study coordinator was taken off probationary status and her work continued to be closely monitored. They waited for an audit before they did anything. Okay, that's number one. Now, you further stated that shortly before being notified of the FDA audit that was to be conducted, the decision was made to terminate the study coordinator after receiving information from her previous employer alleging similar findings during an FDA inspection of work done at her, by her at their site. The study coordinator submitted a letter of resignation and her last day of employment was May 22, 2009. Now, this is my note in terms of, this was not part of the letter, but that date was the day after the FDA inspection was completed at the site, which shows me that that PI was not overseeing her work, was not really properly administering that trial. Your affidavit states that you were unaware of the study coordinators changing the instantaneous scores and that you did not instruct you to do so. Furthermore, we acknowledge the corrective actions you have reported taken to prevent protocol violations in the future. A standard of practice has been established in order to specify expected procedures for correcting mistakes, directing parents on completion of study diary cards and making changes on source documents at the advice of the CRA. What do you think about that now? He's saying that they're going to make changes on the source documents at the advice of the CRA, the monitor. It's a site responsibility, right? So let's just 
skip ahead here. That response was not adequate, by the way. Let's just move ahead with this one a little bit. Okay. The FDA responded, since you stated in your affidavit that you do not recall reviewing the diary data, you failed to ensure that the subjects 257 and 17 met inclusion criteria. And in addition, they noted that this eligibility criteria was falsified. They, he failed to address these things personally, how they would, uh, how he's going to ensure that similar violations do not recur and failed to ensure that the study coordinator was trained and clearly was not overseeing this trial. You know, the investigators are supposed to ensure that the, uh, the adequacy of the patients that are enrolled in their study. You and then, by the way, this is where, this is where it shows how stupid they were in, in the, what they falsified and how stupid they were in, in the, the crazy data they made up. You failed to ensure that your study coordinator to whom you delegated the responsibility of reviewing the completed diaries with the subject's parents understood that an intensity rating score of four was not a possible score. The only thing they could score on this is zero to three. When the coordinator changed the data, she changed it to a four, which was not even something that was supposed to be possible. So they falsify data. But not only did they falsify it, but they made a very stupid mistake and falsify, even falsified the data incorrectly. So again, uh, the FDA said the written response did not address the corrective actions. They were not happy with the response that they got from the investigator here. This one ended up as a NIDPO, meaning that it is a notice of in initiation of disqualification proceedings, an opportunity to explain. NIDPO is worse than a warning letter. NIDPO means they're going to get ready to debar you. They're going to prevent you from doing research. So this is really just the notice that they're going to start those proceedings. They're giving you an opportunity to explain. But once it gets to this stage, you're pretty much um, in pretty deeply. So essentially here, they're telling them that they reviewed the report. They do not find the, uh, their responses and his response adequate. And um, they believe that he is really uh, repeatedly or deliberately violated regulation. There's falsification here, governing the proper conduct of clinical studies, and they're putting him on notice that he's very close to being debarred. Okay, and again, based on they failed to protect the rights and safety and welfare subjects repeatedly or deliberately by submitting false information. And the FDA is proposing that they be, he be disqualified as a clinical investigator. Okay, if you want the reference for that NIDPO letter, you can see the whole thing right at that particular website there. Uh, to see other warning letters, the FDA warning letters website is listed here. Uh, corrective and preventive action plans and written responses, these are recommended by the FDA. Uh, it depends on the nature of the violation, obviously, what your response is going to be. You want to conduct a root cause analysis. It should include a complete description of the corrective action, and it should include a timeline, proposed timeline for correction, and should track well with the observations. In other words, when you get a letter such as this, the site should basically be responding almost in a question and answer format. If they had finding number one, then they'll have an answer to number one. And finding number two, then an answer to number two, as opposed to just a straight narrative. It's taking each particular finding and responding it to it, so almost like, almost like a question and answer um, format. And always remember to put all of the provided, um, provide all of the documentation. If it's a new SOP, include the SOP and the timeline for it. If it's a new, any new document, you want to supply the actual document with a timeline and also the training plan. Also, if there are minutes from a meeting that will describe what your new policy is, you might want to submit that as well. You want to be as complete as possible to have them accept your answers. Example CAPAs, corrective and preventive actions. We want to creating or updating written procedures is something that is a possibility. So either creating a new SOP or updating one. Providing training to the staff. And training is usually not enough. We say training, but it's usually something else that has to go along with the training. Developing templates for minutes. 
that prompts documentation of required content. Another possible CAPA response could be developing templates for investigational product accountability, ensuring all the requirements are captured, and obtaining additional resources to meet the needs of your timely submission and compliance. Sometimes it's hiring more people or getting more resources in some way. Developing continuing education program for the PI and staff would be another potential CAPA. Developing an audit system to find problems. And we find with sites that a lot of them don't have quality checks at their site, but they need to incorporate that, especially if you're delving into some risk-based monitoring now. You're not going to be monitoring 100% of everything. The sites really do need to step up to the plate and have some quality checks in place. And then developing a system to alert the PI of upcoming revisions and IRB approval dates. Okay, a quick knowledge check here. Which of the following are appropriate steps for writing CAPAs? Please go ahead and um, use one of those symbols. Right, using all of the above, right. Yeah, I'm sorry, you don't have the little forward sign. We used to have it in the old format that we had. Absolutely correct. All of the above, D, would be the correct answer. We're using all of those. Now, I just want to skip into now the EMA. As I say, we don't have access to their particular letters, but we do have their findings. And uh, the findings from 2016, they had a total of 1,033 deficiencies comprising 9% were considered critical, 54% were considered major, and then in the minor categories, which are not terrible, 37%. And again, I do, have, I do have a reference to you in terms of where you can find the full report. The EMA inspection findings for 2016, the number of findings, I know this is very small on the screen, but we can see the red has to do with critical, the yellow is major, and the minor are the green. So we can look for the, the largest number here was basically in the general category, which is the second one down. The other two are investigational, product and the trial management operations. Those are the other two big blocks. So we just look for the, the things that have the most in terms of the most findings. And that's how theirs played out for 2016 for the EMA findings. The annual report can be found at this link and you can find the whole report and it's broken down very nicely into the various categories and you can visualize it a lot better than you can with my screenshot on that slide. I also have Health Canada, in case you're interested for that as well. For them, the number one finding had to do with their records, the record keeping, and the number two finding had to do with systems and procedures, and then followed by training issues. So again, informed consent is about number six, again, just like it is here in the U.S. Adherence to the protocol, though, they seem to be better at following directions in the U.S. because adherence to the protocol is number four for them. They have more with the record keeping issues is where they have the bigger block of, of issues in Health Canada. And you can find that full report at this link. And again, I couldn't find the 2016. I found the 2014 and 2015. Uh, 2016, I don't know if they've actually published that yet, but I have not been able to find that online yet. Just a quick wrap up here in terms of hopefully we've now kind of looked at the critical number of major and critical inspection findings and across the three regulatory bodies, Canada, Europe, and, and the U.S., with some specific examples coming from the warning letters. Uh, we do have some sample forms and templates. I want to quickly just go through what I've included for you. In your electronic handouts, we have something um, here is the elements of the informed consent process. This is very useful. Uh, in terms of, let me just go back here. In terms of a site, a, a, a friend of mine actually developed this and gave me permission to share this. Uh, it can be customized for a site, but it just kind of is a checklist to make sure they've done everything they should. Feel free to share this if you want with your site, and if they feel they want to use it, it it's perfectly fine to do so. I just go through making sure they've, you know, it's in their correct language and where there are other people involved. When did the, the time that this, uh, this, uh, the informed consent was signed and so on. So this is a checklist that can just kind of help that the informed consent process. And again, it can be modified. We also have an informed consent history log. So in other words, the various versions that you have 
you know, you might have, a, if you do pediatric studies, you might have, an, you know, um, the regular consent for the adult, the uh, legally authorized representative, and then consequently assent forms for children. You might also have, uh, maybe you have PK uh, consent forms, regular consent, and then the PK consent. So again, all of the different ones here, and in terms of the revision. So this is another nice way of tracking an informed consent history loss. As monitors, we have this. Frequently, sites don't have this. So this is something a site might be able to use. A standard operating procedure. This is just um, standard operating procedure that I got out of the, off the web, which is in uh, general use. And again, just a way to go through uh, sort of a structuring for investigational product accountability in terms of how that could be uh, made operational for a site. Then we have a site FDA inspection preparation checklist which again is just a form that again might be useful if someone is doing FDA studies. And I'd like to open it up for any questions. We're just at 2.30. I'm happy to stay on a couple extra minutes if you have questions. I'm going to open up both of your mics so you can chat in. I hope some of this information was helpful, but I'm open to any questions you have. Yes, very helpful, and uh, thank you very much for the forms and uh, the attachment you just uh, sh you have just shown us. Um, <clears throat> just if you have any, um, I would like to ask you uh, any comment on. Uh, um, <clears throat> the FDA goes about uh, corrections made by the patients versus uh, corrections made by the investigator on informed consent uh, signing because uh, it's uh, that's always the burden for us it's very easy to ask an investigator to correct uh, if they make a mistake according to GCP and it's rather difficult to have a patient doing that properly because of course the patient is not trained and uh, uh, you know the investigator uh, or the study coordinator maybe doesn't notice that uh, uh, when the patient signs and so on so it's sometimes it's it's uh, for us it's difficult to have all the 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 correction uh, done according to gcp on on consenting if the mistake was done by the patient Okay, so uh, as an example, would that be just science making the wrong date, perhaps? Uh, when they yeah, but, uh, like, um, for example, very recently we just <laughs> had a, a wrong date, but of course it was wrong really by by a clear mistake, like the patient wrote that the year was 4017 because I don't know why, and then he just crossed and said 2017, but he didn't initial and date, of course. <laughs> right. Well, then that's, that's, and the patient wouldn't be expected to, to do that, but again, in the source document, in the medical record, there should be a note um, from the investigator or from the coordinator stating the example, you know, what happened. And right, we don't hold the we don't hold the subject responsible for complying with ICH. We can certainly ask them to initial and date something, but if there's been a mistake and it's crossed out or whatever, we want to make a, make a note in the medical record as to what happened, and that should no. be sufficient. Okay, thanks. Okay, that of course that's a point of view. You know, we <laughs> it depends on the auditor or the inspector, of course. Of course, of course, <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah, but of course we can't expect you know we can't expect the uh, the subject to know that they need to sign initial and date. But again, you know if there is something along those lines, the coordinator or the investigator can ask, can you please just initial and date this this change right here? And I think people are used to doing that if they have a legal document they need to sign and you know, um, yeah. so that is something yeah. that could ask them to do. But again, there should be an explanation in the the medical record as to what happened. You know, the patient inadvertently wrote the wrong date or, or whatever. Or maybe, you know, sometimes people write their birth date instead of the actual um, date. Yeah, yeah, I date. guess pe people are nervous when they do this sort of thing. So strange things happen. And <laughs> of, course. of course, of course. And it's expected, you know, it, 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 mistakes happen. We're human. Um, again, the FDA or any, any regulatory body knows that, you know, mistakes happen. What they want to see is that it's just corrected appropriately. Not that we are so perfect that we never make a mistake, because that raises red flags. If we had a study with absolutely no mistakes, 
We start looking mm-hmm. for fraud. We start looking for things that are, you know, hey, what happened here? You know, there should be something that's a little off because we all make a little mistake here and there. So I think just mm-hmm. the idea of having it documented in their source document um, as to what happened does help with that. And uh, just a, a little comment regarding the um, different findings for the different authorities. I think that's part of, of the reason is because EMA uh, audits only prior to marketing while FDA audits also in other situations. So that, that may be, I don't know about the Canadian authority, but maybe, you know, because because EMA uh, goes only when there is a marketing application, maybe the findings are different for that reason. Oh, I see. So you're saying that you don't have an inspection unless you're, it's it's close to the going for the marketing application. It's, it's like well, we don't it. have a, we don't have an EMA inspection. We may have a national uh, inspection like it, Italy or UK. We all have national yes. authorities. Is, and they would come, you know, as the FDA does to the sites and so on. But EMA, as as a central body for the European Union, they go on inspections only uh, when there is a marketing application. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So that's why maybe they have more issues, like I saw trial management and so on. So they have yes. different that, issues. That would explain. Yes, that would probably explain that the discrepancy there or the difference. Yes. I would agree. Okay, uh, is there is there anything else? I mean, if there is something else, we you can always uh, chat in to Barnett, and mm. they will forward any questions to me. Or if you need any other resources, you can you know go through Barnett, and they'll they'll send it to me, and I can send it through to you through them. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Mm-hmm.